Hello, and welcome to Statistically Insignificant, a podcast with slides about statistics with as little math as possible. My name is Tess, my pronouns are she and they, and I will be the stats nerd today. With me is Bart. Hi, Bart. Hey, how's it going? I go by he and him, and uh, since the last episode, I've had my third cup of coffee in the afternoon, so best case scenario, I'll be super focused for this episode, and it will ruin my sleep patterns for the rest of the week. Just what you always wanted. Exactly. Math has been ruining my sleep patterns for years, so I guess it's only fair that I spread <laughs> the disease. Hell yeah. This episode is part two in our series about p-values. If you've not seen the first one, I would suggest you go and do so before this, so you have an idea of what p-values are, and what they are not, because misconceptions about them are extremely common. In this episode, we're going to be talking about p-hacking, what it is, some of the ways that it is done, and the much bigger and, to me, more interesting question of why. This is a political story. It's about money, power, labour, and yes, capitalism. Technical bit first. In the last episode, we defined p-values in the context of a hypothesis test and an observed sample statistic. So we have a null hypothesis, which says uh, it's a status quo thing. So our example was the population mean is equal to some value. But you can phrase the hypothesis uh, constructions like this with regards to any measurable statistic. Your COVID status, whether you are infected or not, in the context of a COVID test, similar structure here. Our alternative hypothesis was that the population mean was not equal to some value. You could also have one-sided hypothesis tests. Go have a look at the other uh, video for that. In the context of this, to construct a p-value, we assume that the null hypothesis is true and determine the probability distribution of what we observe on our sample, our sample mean in the case of this particular example, then ask how likely we are to have seen a sample statistic at least as far from the proposed value if the null hypothesis is true. It's a metric for how much what you observed deviates from what you would expect to see if the null hypothesis is true. p-values are also used to make a decision once we have chosen a threshold of enough evidence or far enough from what we expect to see. If the p-value is less than some threshold we call alpha, which is the probability of a false positive, if the null hypothesis is true, then we consider that enough evidence to reject our null hypothesis and have what we call a statistically significant result. As I mentioned in the last episode, that's where the shit pun in the pod name comes from. So p-values are one way of doing what we call null hypothesis significance testing, which has done a lot for us for decisions about medical treatments, to establishing evidence for the Higgs boson, or giving support to claims of systemic discrimination and, and inequality. A null hypothesis significance test is precisely this construction. You pick some threshold value of the probability of a false positive when the null hypothesis is true, and if what you observed is sufficiently unlikely, whether you use a p-value or some other construction, you reject the null hypothesis. It's desirable for a researcher to get a statistically significant result. It gives weight to your explanation of evidence. There are some exceptions when we check assumptions for models, but we're not going to address that at least. That's more like, am I ticking all the right boxes? Have I used the right analysis? The results of the analysis are where this kind of construction would take place. So with the p-value test, we have these two numbers, the p-value itself and the threshold for rejecting the null hypothesis, which is the significance, alpha. Alpha is a socially agreed upon threshold for what is sufficient evidence. We also have an incentive structure. As neutral as scientists want to be, p smaller than alpha, rejecting the null hypothesis, is a favourable outcome. P-hacking is then ways of unscrupulously shaping the data to make p as small as possible in order to make it more likely that you'll get a statistically significant result. Ask me how many times I can say statistically insignificant before the words lose all meaning. <laughs> As we will see, that incentive is oh so much bigger than just self-assurance that our ideas are correct. For now though, we're going to examine some ways that p-hacking manifests. The first, and perhaps the most grey area in some respect, is excluding problem data points. We have spoken before about measurement being messy, and I have tried to avoid dropping the word outlier into those conversations. Outliers are not the same as errors, there's some overlap. An outlier is a point that is a long way from the rest of the data. 
That means you need both a structure of distance in your data and some threshold for what is far away. Let's say I'm looking at fish in a small pond and I'm measuring their size. I observe fish in centimetres that are seven centime 6 centimetres, 7, 8, 10, 11, 17, and 103. That is, these are the measurements that I make. Now, that 103 centimetres, probably an error where you, an extra digit was added. It's an order of magnitude bigger than the rest, and a metre long fish in a small pond would be quite cramped. Not physically impossible, but we could probably reasonably assume that that is an error, as opposed to just like an unusually large fish. It is also an outlier, however, something that is a long way from the rest of the data. If we think about this 17 instead, this could also be an outlier, and it's, as it's a fair bit larger than its closest neighbour, the 11, right? But it's not unreasonable to think you could have a 17 centimetre long fish. Sure. It's reasonable in terms of the scale with respect to the other things that you have measured. So the 17 may be an outlier, but it's probably not an error in that sense. If I then add that this 8 centimetre fish was actually a 9 centimetre fish which had a data entry error, this would be an error, but it's not an outlier, it's right in the middle of a pack. Right. I say could be an outlier because there's no hard and fast definition for what an outlier is. There are some common thresholds used with particular statistical tools, but there's no like stats deity handing down stone tablets to say what is and is not an outlier. Outliers can make trends and patterns much muddier in data, much less like easy to observe, I suppose. So if there are one or two data points which are a long way from the rest and, you're, and mean your result isn't statistically significant, you might get away with excluding them as outliers. You might not even be wrong to do so, but it's really hard and you have to provide a justification of that and ideally you should report on that fact when you write up your data. People may not even realise what they're doing is a problem with excluding outliers because it's very easy to convince yourself that uh, taking them out is the right thing to do. Well, also, like, um, in that case, like, the 103, if it was, say, a dam rather than a tank, mm. you could have one Murray cod and the rest a carp or whatever. And so that is an accurate um, observation, yeah. but... It this is, is why like, so much of it is intensely context-dependent. There's no straightforward answer because there's no straightforward situation to measure, right? Yeah. So so much of this and so many of the thresholds that you kind of, if, if you even try to construct a reasonable threshold for it, it's hard, it's a lot of work, and it requires potentially a lot more information than you actually have, which is one of the reasons that this gets really fuzzy is when people do this without justification. So what tends to happen is in this context, you have a couple of points where if you leave them out, your p-value is smaller than alpha. If you keep them in, your p-value is bigger than alpha. So you are incentivized to find an explanation for why those should be left out. Unfortunately, if they are like genuine measurements, genuine part of the population that should not be excluded, it's a real problem if you then leave them out to do so. Number two is biased sampling. We talked about this before in episode 7. It's a form, as a form of p-hacking, it's more specific, because I would argue that this requires some sort of intent. I guess it's a kind of data exclusion where you don't even measure stuff that would be messy or have complicated results. This is a whole thing in medical research. Ideally less so now that we have things like tracking of studies for um, new drugs that did not exist like a couple of decades ago and there were some real problems with that. But it's very common to exclude groups of people from trials on the basis that um, there may be like difficult results for them or whatever else. People with very large bodies, for example, which can be a real problem when it comes to calibrating drug dosages for those same people later on. I think I mentioned this way back in our first episode, but there is actually a threshold of like body mass where hormonal contraceptives, as normally prescribed, are not effective because the drug levels of the hormones in your blood that you get out of them don't wind up being high enough to actually provide protection against pregnancy. Another classic example is actually the exclusion of women entirely, or female 
of whatever species from um, trials. Notoriously, a lot of drug trials on rats don't include female rats because they give unreliable results, which, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you also have problems, and this is less so about pee hacking so much as in general, but a whole bunch of treatments, even for things like stroke or heart attack or descriptions of the observed symptoms, are based on like cis male physiology, which sucks for the rest of us. What you're doing in these cases is you're making a result quote unquote easier to measure by excluding cases which may be unclear or behave in an undesirable way. If you are only going to make claims about the subset of the population that you actually do include, that's not p-hacking. That's not a bad thing. If you go on to make claims without talking about the fact that you've excluded particular groups about a broader population which includes them, then it becomes a real problem. Because if your statistically significant result is only on, say, like, if, if you imagine this is your whole population, and you get a statistically significant result on this bit of it, knowing that you've excluded, say, this bunch of people over here who don't sh exhibit a strong response, that's a problem. And this is, like... This is particularly frustrating because people don't generally give you the kind of information about their sample which would actually let you make a kind of informed decision about whether or not they've done this. Yeah. Usually you will you will get um like gender reported a lot of the time um which you can do something like that but you may or may not get weight or body mass or body size reported for drug trials. Very frustrating. The third type of p-hacking we're going to look at is what I'd call selective reporting. So this is kind of intimately related to biased sampling, but this is um, biased sampling that kind of happens after you've collected the data. In this case, you have some sort of grouping variable, or a bunch of them, which subdivide your sample. If there is a group or a couple of group which, groups which have a statistically significant result, and you only report on those and you don't admit that you've actually sampled all these other groups and that they had showed nothing, that's a form of p-hacking. Right. Now, you may well have found a subgroup for which there is something happening, but you should at least report on the rest as well. You also need to be really careful with sample sizes because a small group of subject, research subjects, whether that's people or whatever else, is more likely to find something that is statistically significant compared to the general population than a bigger group. As we will see in just a second, the more additional grouping variables you have, the higher the chance that at least one of them will give you a significant result for a relationship that doesn't actually exist. Next up, we have repeated hypothesis testing. Let's say I set my significance, alpha, to 0 0.05. This is the probability of observing a false positive when the null hypothesis is true. That's the risk I'm prepared to take, right? Yeah. So if I am testing, like, shitloads of null hypotheses, different ones on the same, across whatever, I expect approximately 1 in 20 results to be false positive. So if I test 20 hypotheses, chances are I'll see at least one positive result, even if none of them are real. This is a particular problem for big data or data mining research. If you have a lot of variables, you're almost certain to find something statistically significant. There's actually a bunch of mathematical theorems which tell us that this happens, and happens more often with a greater number of variables. Online advertisers drowning in Facebook data where every feature of a person's life and interaction with Facebook is measured, for example, particularly prone to this. Or if you have a research lab producing dozens of different compounds and testing every single one as a new potential drug, or fertilizer, or whatever, they will see false positives at approximately whatever rate they decide to fix their, uh, their significance at. Yeah. The grouping variables in selective reporting are a type of this as well. Like, if you have enough grouping variables that once you s split your sample out, you have like 20 different subgroups, even if none of them are actually real, whatever you're testing is probably going to ping as positive on at least one of those. It's also really hard to manage this one, even if you are trying to avoid like unethical research reporting or whatever else, because you can't necessarily distinguish 
or you can't in fact distinguish between the real result and the false positive. You just kind of have to say, can I do this again? Is there other evidence that can support what I'm seeing? And you can't always test things twice, unfortunately. Is it that unethical to scam a company that's trying to use Facebook data to advertise more effectively? <laughs> That, not so much, I think. But, I mean, <laughs> for example, I fully support people lying on surveys in Facebook. It's more like there's a lot of, as we will talk about, you know, resources are scarce in, re in research. And yeah. they're much more plentiful in marketing, to my immense frustration. <laughs> if you are, for example, trying to get as much out of your data as you can, so you just go and test a whole bunch of different things, and, oh, this is significant, I'll go and investigate it some more. That's not bad science necessarily. You just have to be really paranoid about what you're doing. But at the same time, it's very difficult to control for this because arguably, if I am testing three separate hypotheses on three separate uh, bits of data or whatever, then I shouldn't really take into account that there are three of those tests to choose alpha because if they're all different data sets, it shouldn't matter what else I'm yeah. doing. So it's really quite fraught to have these fixed alpha thresholds and then to test a whole bunch of different things. There are some um, corrections that are done in very specific technical contexts to try and control that. But in general, it's just kind of a problem that you have to deal with and you have to hope that there is enough replication of research to control for this. There isn't. There never <laughs> is. There's not the funding for it. Uh, the last one that I'm going to talk about is, uh, very vaguely in fact, various gory technical situations. There are a lot of technique-specific methods which we do not have the time or the background to go into, and many more I probably do not know about because I've never used those analysis methods before. A lot of this overlaps with the other examples that we've seen, but there's also a broad category I would put in here, which is where assumptions of a particular analysis are not met. They may not even be checked for. One of the most common of these is fitting a line to data. So if you've ever heard of a line of best fit, that kind of thing. We call these linear models. Linear meaning line. <laughs> Basic linear models make an assumption about what the distribution of the population is in the underlying data. So the associated hypothesis tests rely on those assumptions being met, or the hypothesis tests become invalid. So one of them, and I can demonstrate this quite easily, so one of them relies that um, what's called the error, so what's left over once you take away what the model expects to see, or the deviation from what you observe and what the model tells you, should be normally distributed, which means looks roughly like this, and centered at zero. Yep. Okay. If once you actually uh, do your analysis, what you observe is something like this in your residuals, as they are known, that's a problem because these are wildly different distributions. So you might get a result that is statistically significant, but you're actually in this situation, so your hypothesis tests aren't valid because the assumptions that they rely on are not met. Right. It is shockingly rare to see this kind of checking of assumptions done in a lot of areas. Like people will go ahead and fit their model because you've got this, you know, nice little scatter plot looking like this and you go, oh, okay, I'm going to do my line of best fit to that, right? Yeah. Statistically significant result, rah, 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 I'm going to publish. You never check this stuff and it's all kind of like everything you publish on is invalid, unfortunately. Well, our entire education system seems to me to be built around hammering um, high school results into a linear model. Oh my god, it's... Oh. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it is. And, like, one of the things I find so frustrating in a lot of social science is that this may be one of the only models that the people doing that analysis have ever seen. And they may not have seen it done properly with this after analysis of are my assumptions met. So you see an awful lot of, let's say, problematic statistics pulled out of education stuff where you have to ask, is what's being measured valid in the first place? And then is this statistical analysis valid on top of that? 
and it produces questionable results, let's say. I just don't <laughs> think that really kind of simple statistical techniques that were built off of measurements in physical science, it's extremely rare for them to be usable in the social science because you just have such a more complex situation and such a, like, a situation that is not amenable to numbers. It's annoying. I hate it. Stop trying to quantify <laughs> shit. Well, um, uh, sorry, my ex-girlfriend was a teacher and, um, like, one of the most foundational documents at the moment is a book by a guy whose name I've forgotten, unfortunately. Alas. But, uh, but it was basically doing a bunch of meta studies on education, mm. which came to the conclusion that class size didn't actually affect outcomes or had less effect in outcomes. That's interesting. Factors. Yes. I, hmm. If you find it, send that to me because I would like to have a look at it. <laughs> I will. These are not an exhaustive list, but hopefully they give you some idea of the potential pitfalls. Now I want to talk politics. The fundamental incentive structure at play is that an academic's job, their livelihood, depends on publications. For teaching intensive academics, this is relaxed somewhat, but you get shat in so many other ways. <laughs> Keeping your job, applying for a new one, promotions or research funding depend on your status as somebody who publishes consistently, ideally in high-profile journals, citations on your papers, that sort of thing. Publish or perish, as it is known. P-hacking comes into play when journals have a bias towards publishing statistically significant results. This has been extremely common in the past few generations. There is an issue with negative results, that is, results where you don't reject the null hypothesis, that you may have a false negative. Your research technique may have been sloppy, or you use the wrong technique, or you just happen to get a sample which didn't register the actual effect that was there. It is much harder to control the false negative rate, particularly because it is um, more impacted that by your sample size. So because your funding is limited, your sample size is typically quite restrictive. So your false negative rate goes up as your sample shrinks. Right. Yeah, it's, it's really problematic. And it's particularly problematic when funding is as tight as it is. <laughs> However, when being averse to that risk leads journals to literally reject any paper that does not have a statistically significant result, you have fucked up your scientific process. In this situation, an academic's livelihood is now tied to their ability to get significant results, which are most commonly determined by p-values. But the same constructions that we use for other types of this null hypothesis uh, testing have exactly the same effects. They're all equivalent. Everything that affects p-values, everything that is p-hacking will affect those in the same way. Researchers are human and will justify bad decisions that support their material interests. Maybe you remember the measurement of this data point it was a little funny, so you could exclude it, it's justifiable. Maybe you are sure that this subgroup has something going on. Maybe if you just test this one last hypothesis, you'll finally get a significant result. I don't think that researchers are malicious on the whole, just incentivized to self-delusion with the occasional helping of corner cutting due to tight resources and a lack of rigorous statistical training. We are not helped to make good choices by a publishing industry which thrives on our desperation. So I'm going to take a second here to add just a hint of my rage about said academic publishing industry. People who think that academics aren't exploited workers ignore this entire structure and have never taught a university classroom in their lives. Publishers basically print money from unpaid academic labor. As mentioned, we have to publish, but the companies that own journals don't pay authors. They also don't pay peer reviewers, maybe not even editors. That's basically everyone involved in the labor to produce an article who gets no money for it. Almost all journals do charge for access to read articles. They certainly rake in blood monies from libraries at universities, which pay for access to what was written by the staff at the very same university. Beyond this, publishers have come up with a really nasty system where you, the researcher, who has done all the work to produce an article, pay them to publish it. In many cases, this is explained as a fee so that the article can be published without a paywall, because of course the rent seekers have to be compensated for the revenue they would lose. Top journals can charge five or ten thousand dollars. 
At the other end of the prestige ladder are journals which will publish literally anything if you pay them. $2,000 for four guaranteed publications sounds like a great deal. You can just pump out crap all the time. Your statistics, <laughs> your uh, metrics will go through the roof. But hang on. Well, uh, that material conditions that you're talking about are reliant on getting in the prestigious ones, right? Yes and no. You have better opportunities if you get into the more prestigious journals. But if you're desperate to keep your job and the university is looking at cutting staff as they did during COVID or repeatedly in the years prior, and then one of their metrics is how many publications you've had in the last five years, you'll take whatever. Yeah. Like there was a really stupid case at Sydney Uni where they fired someone um, for not publishing enough just after they got a $5 million grant to do research. <laughs> Yeah, and they were about to have a book come out which had actually consumed their time in the past five years, which is why they hadn't been publishing other stuff. It's just ridiculous. Like, yeah. this is what I mean by, like, your job really does depend on it. And because universities have been consumed by the capitalist effort to measure things with key performance indicators and blah, 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 right? It, it becomes an encroachment on your ability to do good research. And it sucks for everyone except the bean counters. Yeah. So imagine I have these four papers that I want to put in these gutta journals that I'll just, I'll just pay each one 500 bucks, put it out there, please, I need to save my job, right? If I do a bit of p-hacking so I can put statistically significant results in the abstract too, that might get past a sniff test. Like somebody could read the abstract even if they're a bit suspicious of the journal, they go and read the abstract, they say, okay, they've collected some data, they've done some tests, the results are statistically significant, sure. Because, like, People making these decisions don't necessarily have the time to go and scratch at those articles because it takes like 20 minutes to an hour to thoroughly read one. Yeah. The incentives are there. It probably won't get detected unless it's really egregious. And, you know, arguably people think, well, well, what's the harm? My other work's fine. I'm doing my best. It's, it's easy to justify to yourself. Yeah. I would argue that the publishing industry is the root of a lot of that evil because they, they do so much money goes into pub academic publishing and we get fuck all of it. Yeah. The whole thing is ruthlessly exploitative and fest is a top of university system that relies on other unpaid labor and unpaid teaching work as well. It's all fucked. And anybody who tries to tell me that, uh, the, that academics are sitting in like ivory towers and are wealthy and whatever else, realistically, no. And that's not even addressing the casualization problems. Anyway, that's my rant for the day. <laughs> I would say, in my experience talking to academics, though, there is a thing about uh, the kind of, let's go with the Steinbeck thing, the temporary, temporarily embarrassed... Uh, Millionaires? Tenured professor. Oh, God. Yeah. Um. <laughs> that's, that's a generational thing, I find. Because for younger people, younger, I mean, let's say under 40, emerging researchers, perhaps, would be a better term for that. Yeah. Tenure's vanishing. Like, Australia yeah. has not had tenure as a system. You have people with permanent jobs, but you don't really have a tenure track idea. And America is even worse than us. And, like, people wind up on just rolling three-year contracts, casual contracts. They don't have, like, any kind of provision for stability or long-term planning because yeah. the university doesn't want to pay permanent staff because the university doesn't have the money to play, pay permanent staff because their funding keeps getting cut. For sure. I want to wrap up by talking about some of the things that have been done to reduce p-hacking problems. There are both good and bad, of course, in my utterly unhumble opinion. One example of what I think a bad response is, is banning the use of the null hypothesis significant testing in published articles. This is something that was done by Basic and Applied Psychology Journal, for example. This got publicized as banning p-values, which strictly it is not as all of the other ways we talked about of doing null hypothesis significance testing were also prohibited, but the way that they wrote at it, about it did single out p-values as ground for not publishing articles. This is a bad approach, as far as I'm concerned at least, because as we've discussed, p-values are more than just a number you can compare to another number to reject the null hypothesis. They are a metric for how much what you observed deviates from what you expected to see when the null hypothesis is true. That's really useful. It is in fact possible to report p-values 
in that context, with that interpretation, alongside other statistical data, without using them for null hypothesis null hypothesis statistics testing. I wonder if I'll leave that one in. <laughs> when it comes to NHST, fuck it. Uh, more generally, I think that we are in a period of transition between a situation where it is the only structure we use to something more complex. Until we are through substantially more of that transition, it's not a bad way to go about decisions. And in many respects, the person doing the research is the best position to weigh up whether what they observed is enough to reject the null hypothesis. There's probably going to be development along the lines of, well, you have your p-value as one piece of information, but you also have your effect size, and you also have some other analyses alongside that. And collectively, you build that together to make an argument to reject the null hypothesis. You don't just say p is smaller than alpha, let's go. This does need caution, of course, and researchers will need a lot of training to make the transition between that testing structure and whatever comes next. I mean, arguably a lot of researchers already lack the statistical training that they really need to do what they do. Uh, they also don't generally come to talk to statisticians about it either. You should do that. If, you know, <laughs> if I am describing you, go talk to a statistician. There are also meta-analysis methods which aggregate results across different studies in order to determine what the overall evidence is. These are frequently built from the statistics used for the null hypothesis statistics testing, which significance testing, which become much more difficult if those statistics aren't published. The situations where meta-analysis can be done are pretty selective in the sense that you need replication to do it, and relatively few studies ever get repeated. But where they can be done, a meta-analysis is much less susceptible to problems from p-hacking than individual studies. We will talk about replicating studies another time, and the fact that when I rule the world, what I'll actually do is abdicate that position, and just go run a research institute, which all it does is replicate studies. That would be great. <laughs> A good response, on the other hand, could look like what the European Journal of Personality has done. In this case, rather than submit a manuscript after the research has been done, authors submit a research proposal, they call this a registered report, with methods, uh, literature background, that sort of thing. Pilot study, if you've done a pilot study, that gets in there. If the proposal is accepted for publication, then a report of the results is guaranteed to be published even if the results it produces are not statistically significant. I think that this is particularly good because, for one, it forces people to be very explicit and accountable in their methods. For two, it allows for the publication of results that are amenable to a meta-analysis. And three, it forces reviewers to think more about the methods than the results. And even if we don't want to, the results can change what we think about the research. Yeah. Is that specific journals are doing that? Um, so the European Journal of Personality is one. I think that there are others. I do not remember the names off the top of my head. Yeah, okay. But yeah. It's, not, it's not endemic in the industry yet. No, uh, this is not necessarily something that you could use in every situation. Right. Yeah, I think it's not, it's not a bad start. I think it's a very good structure to uh, begin with. But so much else kind of needs to change in the way that academic work happens for this to be like universally applicable. Universally right. applicable in situations where you could have hypothesis testing anyway. Not all research actually works like that. Yeah. <laughs> Maths, for example. There's also approaches which directly address the material conditions of academics. Shockingly, these have not been done. And if anything, it's becoming an even more punishing industry to be in. More research funding, more positions with better like pay and better working situations, better support for teaching and admin. So research academics aren't asked to do both or all three of these things. They're frequently very bad at teaching. And teaching staff have some breathing room if they need to publish. These will make better research possible and give people the space and the resources to not cut corners. Researchers are curious people. We certainly have our biases and resistances to new ideas, but in general we want to do good research. After all, with the kind of qualifications that get you a research job, you could be making way more money in private industry. One final note. There are fields which don't use null hypothesis significance testing because their methods are just not amenable to constructing the statistics which allow it. 
That's not a problem with the validity of the research, it just means that those statistics are the wrong tool to use. A lot of social science is like this because you can't quantify human experience very well. Maths is another field which doesn't use it because maths is not a science and doesn't do the best explanation of the evidence which null hypothesis significance testing is built for. All right, as mentioned last time, this double episode series isn't going to have a mailbag segment. If you desperately want more, go check out the bonus episodes on our Patreon. You get one extra episode every month, and at the $10 tier you get early episodes too, when I actually get around to editing them before they need to be released anyway. But thank you so much again. Thank you very much for having me. And I'll talk to you next time. Speak to you then. <laughs>